and a couple of the players went on to get gold medals in the Olympics in Seoul in 1988. But those of you in the audience um, that learned to play hockey way back in the last century will recognize this. We played on grass pitches, which were notoriously bumpy and which added a lovely element of chance to the game. India was the greatest hockey nation, having won gold medals at nine Olympic Games. In the 1970s, the first synthetic pitches started to be introduced. This technology was to radically alter the game. The ball roll became more predictable. New rules were introduced. Completely new techniques were learned, and hockey sticks changed shape and started to be made out of carbon fiber rather than wood. But the game started to become faster, required greater fitness levels, and became much more of a popular spectator sport. But as far as I was concerned, it took all the skill out of the game. I did not adapt well to the new surface, and the team that I went, went on to play for was one of the last to switch to the new surface. By the, ninth, by the end of the 1990s, all league games had, been, were, had transferred to being played on synthetic turf, and our grass game technique didn't transfer. We were left behind, high and dry, scratching our heads. That was the end of my hockey career. What on earth, you may be wondering, has that got to do with life sciences? Let's start by looking back at what has already been achieved by the industry. You don't need me to tell you that over the last 60 years, the industry has delivered over 1,200 new drugs that have played an important part in improving public health and extending life expectancy. The life sciences have been successful at breakthrough innovations, introducing treatments like antiretrovirals and chemotherapy, transforming killer diseases into those in which some patients can expect to live normal lives. And we, we are now all in a golden age of scientific discovery. We're in the middle of a biological revolution. The progress made around sequencing of the human genome has led to a huge potential for the industry. In the future, we will be able to transform the way we develop drugs to focus on personalized medicines. We can leverage the power of big data to help, to help speed up these discoveries. You will already be aware that healthcare demands are higher than ever before. By the year 2050, there will be more individuals over the age of 60 than aged 15 or below. The aging population is producing an explosion of chronic diseases with increasingly complex health needs. Governments are struggling to find the resources to match demand. Ultimately, they are looking for ways to improve health outcomes at a much lower cost. This has led to greater scrutiny of existing treatments, as those who are paying are no longer prepared to pay for treatments that aren't able to clearly demonstrate improved patient outcomes. You won't be surprised to hear from me say that I believe the industry must embrace much more radical, <coughs> radical transformation if it's going to capitalize on this potential 
whilst adapting to a dramatically different and increasingly demanding healthcare ecosystem. So how do we do that? What is standing in the way of change? What is standing in the way of innovation? Although everyone is talking about it, the fact remains that the current industry model does not put the patient at the heart of its decision making. Judgments are driven by developments that lead to blockbuster products, which in turn are expected to drive blockbuster returns for shareholders. This approach demands an all-consuming focus on the product and all too often leaves the patient as an afterthought. A recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine found that over 50% of drug approvals in the last 10 years have received approval without demonstrating any tangible benefit to the patient. In Germany, new regulations stipulate that treatments are only approved and paid for if they can demonstrate improved health outcomes. This approach is beginning to impact the life sciences industry and it's clear that we need to adapt. But what does putting the patient at the center actually mean for the industry? Of course, I am no scientist. I've worked for KPMG for the last 30 years, but I do understand how companies plan, allocate capital and resources, and implement change. And we've all seen other interest industries transform to service or solution models. And there are some great examples on this slide. In my view, the industry needs to switch from a product push to a much more service oriented model where the needs of the patient are the focus. This is just as true for generic companies as it is for the IP owners. This will inevitably lead to new revenue streams. On average around the world, about 90% of the healthcare budget is spent on services and infrastructure, whereas only 10% is spent on drugs. And this is going to require a huge shift in focus from the drug to the patient, the customer, and their health outcomes. So what should that change look like? The conversations I've been having with senior executives around the world suggest that there is a recognition that something needs to change, but currently there isn't a clear picture of, of what that change should look like and how much change is needed. Moving to a service orientated business, the, the in, the industry will need to move away from the perception of the value chain as a linear process, with R&D innovation happening only at one end and customers and patients involved at the other. We need to begin to think about the value chain as a value ecosystem, which puts the patient and the customer at the center of the system, with the other business services wrapped around their needs. In this model, innovations flows more easily through all areas of the business. In order to facilitate this kind of restructure, I would suggest that companies need to make three fundamental shifts which take real innovation. The first step is to, pr to promote new business models. Why are new business models required? Well, the main reason is that the traditional research model is not working as it used to. Despite more than a 100% increase in spending 
The number of molecules being produced has remained largely flat since the 1980s. Analysis we have performed at KPMG found that the return on R&D expenditure has fallen from an industry average of about 20% 20, 20 years ago to an average of about 10% now. So companies are barely getting a return on their weighted average cost of capital, and this all demonstrates why PE ratios have fallen so significantly and why investors are not attributing much value to companies' product pipelines. However, a, a good example of a new model in R&D is the leap of faith Eli Lilly took to trial a new system of R&D. It funded an autonomous R&D unit, Chorus, free from corporate pressures. It was allowed to dictate its own research program it's been a huge success delivering almost a third of the molecules in their late stage pipeline at a lower cost and in less time. It is a similar story with the sales and marketing model. A colleague of mine, Professor Hilary Thomas, was advising a big pharma client who had sacked a series of sales representatives because their techniques weren't increasing drug sales. Remarkably, this resulted in an increase in sales. I believe this was because they weren't thinking about the customer need. And I was recounting this story at an industry dinner, and a client pointed out what Abvi had been doing with their low T test. They've turned around the traditional push marketing model, which relentlessly targets clinicians. Rather, it provides consumers with an online symptom diagnostic tool and advice portal. They create demand for their treatments through a pool model as patients request the product from their doctors. And it's working. Sales of testosterone therapy have increased from 300 million in 2002 to about $3 billion uh, today. This is a great example of innovation by using digital channels to change the business model. Companies need to satisfy the short term as well as the long term needs of shareholders. However, the preoccupation with short-term quarterly financial results must not get in the way of allocating time and resources to innovation in business model redesign across the entire organization. Let's move to step two. Despite testaments otherwise, companies have been focused on products and not on solutions for patients. Teams, in my experience, are typically organized around diseases or on a market and not patients, and they don't help us understand the patient's health needs. A better understanding of the patient needs allows us to develop more innovative patient-centered treatments. I think it's incredible the number of different companies that are trying to enter the healthcare sphere that you would have never have imagined five years ago. At KPMG, we've just set up a $100 million fund, KPMG Capital, to invest in data and analytics companies. I get calls at least once a week from businesses focused on all sorts of patient centric health solutions. And these companies are looking at the largest diseases which affects us today. Take for example diabetes. The total number of diabetics in India alone is 40 million. It's becoming a global pandemic. I think it's interesting that Google 
have put some of their brightest minds to better ways of glucose, glucose monitoring and come up with a glucose lens which does just that. They appear to have put the patient at the center of their research question and developed a disrupt disruptive product, the glucose monitoring contact lens, which may make certain medtech glucose monitoring tools obsolete. It could also potentially expand service offerings, adding new revenue streams like leveraging value from other data the lens collects. And by putting the patient at the center of their value ecosystem, Novo Nordisk were able to move to a much more service-oriented approach to treating diabetes. They talked to diabetics and sought to understand how the disease affects them across the disease life cycle. They involved patients in designing their own treatment model. The resulting pilot provided a suite of treatments for diabetics that went beyond the simple dose of insulin. They delivered service such as text alerts, reminding patients when to take their medication, and provide treatments for other aspects of the disease, such as eye tests. This model of treatment addresses the patient needs and not just the symptom of high blood, uh, blood sugar. It leads to better patient outcomes through improved compliance and glycemic control. Now the third step I want to talk about is a, is a need to foster, foster a culture of collaboration. In the past, it has been much easier for life sciences companies to operate as closed units. Collaboration between organizations creates tension around ownership and competition and is perceived to be a threat to treasured intellectual property. Far more collaboration is taking place particularly between academic institutions, biotech and pharma companies, but this culture of collaboration needs to go further. Particularly, particularly complex health problems will be served, solved faster if there is more collaboration across the globe. The high number of failures in late stage R&D projects for complex diseases like Alzheimer's is probably quite good evidence that the go it alone approach may not be working. However, change is happening. Just last month, Johnson & Johnson announced a clinical trial data sharing model that it hopes will set a new level of transparency in the industry. Instead of providing direct access to trial data themselves, a third party will service as gatekeeper and approve access requests. Researchers can access previous trial data so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. An open source R&D is already pioneered here in India to speed up drug discovery and treatments for diseases such as tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV. Collabor collaboration within an organization is just as important for innovation. I was talking to the head of innovation at a global pharmaceutical company over dinner a few weeks ago. He described the biggest barrier to fostering collaboration and innovation across his company was the concrete layer of management between the people who are on the ground and understand the changing landscape across the healthcare system and the executives in the leadership positions who can actually support and challenge innovation. I think a great example of cl collaboration is a large global organization uh, is how GE tried to get its employees to collaborate to solve supply chain issues. Through an online portal, GE's 
eco-imagination campaign links suppliers, engineers, and customers, providing a platform to share ideas on how to improve logistics. The program, since its launch in 2005, has generated billions in additional revenue for GE. The CEO of Google says the reason they succeed at innovation is because of the culture and behavior they support, not because of the amount of money they spend. They create failure-friendly environments and give employees 15% of their working time to work on new project ideas. So to conclude, the business pod model that has powered our industry, our industry's early success is showing signs of fatigue. Costs are skyrocketing, breakthrough innovation is ebbing, competition is intense, and sales growth is flattening. Companies that are going to be successful over the next 20 years are the ones that can innovate to find new models that address real issues healthcare systems face across the world, put a patient perspective at the heart of everything they do, and find ways to better collaborate across the whole healthcare ecosystem. Life sciences companies need to recognize that the healthcare landscape is changing everywhere and the devil is in the detail. Life sciences companies are in the main global in nature, but healthcare systems are local with dis different, systems, um, different systems and regulation which vary massively from country to country and from state to state. And most of these healthcare structures are in flux. The game is changing. Finding the solutions to succeed in this new landscape is not easy. Just as I found out from resisting the change from grass to synthetic surfaces on the hockey field, and the Indian hockey team that is still waiting for that elusive Olympic medal in the modern era on a synthetic surface. Lots of innovation is required, focused on the patient. Thank you.